Okay, I understand this question might be a little bit weird, but what is, what is thought? Sometimes imagining something can help you uh, surface how you understand that thing. So when we imagine the act of thinking, what do we imagine in our mind? What's the image of thinking that we hold? How you answer that question reveals your current perception of the nature of cognition. And as we'll see in this video, subtly but significantly impacts how you think. Last week, after overviewing the, the three ages of work, we ended with this question. What's the one thing that did not substantially change across those three ages? M maybe thing is the wrong word here. Can you guess it? What's your guess? Actually think of an answer. While, while the space, the time, the tools, the products and speed of work morphed, the worker did not. Why is this important? It means there's a universal permanent foundation on which workflow can be designed and built. There are particular behaviors that are always relevant and liberating. These behaviors, if integrated and harmonized, form a behavioral ecosystem, an actual art, a form of excellence. And because it's neither fleeting nor arbitrary, this art can be articulated and therefore taught learned and shared. This foundation can only be ignored at one's own peril. Some rules can be changed, these can't. In his latest book, A World Without Email, Cal Newport touches on this dynamic when describing what he calls the, quote, unfortunate mismatch between our modern tools and ancient brains, end quote. There are certain things that are, as he says, etched into our neural circuits so strongly that we must respect them and design our tools and our approach to work around them. For example, after exploring the pros of email, that is the elimination of overhead, its immediacy, it's sort of this just-in-time efficiency, Newport counters that these abstract values offered by email, quote, quickly dissipates when we're forced to confront the concrete reality of how our ancient brains evolved in a context far removed from electronic networks and low friction messaging actually function when asked to rapidly switch between many different targets of attention, end quote. This means that proper workflow principles are dependent on a sound understanding of anthropology. As a little exercise, Let's imagine the act of thinking. We mentioned this at the, at the beginning of the video. In our minds, let's paint a picture of this act, this act of thinking, and really actually do this. What do you see? Do you see anything? When we explore this question in our mastery program, there are a cluster of common answers. Many essentially see nothing. They see a thought bubble or some formless black space. Another popular mental picture is Rodin's thinking man, you know, a statue, right? A few others had a more science-y, I guess you could say, image. Uh, you know, something like neurons firing or a brain pulsating. The insight behind this question is not found in what you imagined. It's found in what you didn't imagine. Most likely, neither a specific physical environment nor any of the five senses played a leading role in your mental image of thinking. Yet, both of these are intimately involved in the actual thinking process. Modern psychological research has been revealing the embodied or distributed nature of human cognition. And this is echoed in ancient and medieval philosophy. Aristotle, in his work Metaphysics, 
says, quote, all men by nature desire to know. All men by nature desire to know. What does he point to in order to support that claim? He says the following, an indication of this is the delight we take in our senses. <laughs> Were you expecting that? Did that come out of left field for you? In Article 6 of Question 84 in the first part of the Summa, St. Thomas Aquinas writes, quote, the principle of knowledge is in the senses, end quote. And further adding on that, he says that on the part of the phantasms, intellectual knowledge is caused by the senses. And that sensible knowledge is the, quote, material cause of intellectual knowledge. We even have hints of this, uh, you know, in the English language. For example, if you notice something about another person, we say that you sensed something. And there are etymological connections here with words like nonsense or common sense, or even something like resent or resentment. Human thought involves the entirety of the person. It's not a purely internal, immaterial, platonic activity not only because it involves the senses, uh, but also because it's connected with the physical environment, which makes impressions on our senses. But if we're ignorant or forgetful of this anthropological truth, we tend to handicap our own thinking process. If we're confused about something or stuck in a decision, we think the only thing we can do about it is think about it. So we close out the world, we lock down the body, we shut our eyes and desperately search the palace of our mind in complete darkness. Whereas instead of ju just thinking about whatever is on our mind, we could turn on the lights of our mind by, by grabbing some pen and paper to brainstorm our thoughts or by going on a walk or a run or by talking out loud with a friend. It's important that we get this right. Our view of human nature, accurate or inaccurate, affects how we act for better or for worse. In addition to being accurate, a sound understanding of human nature ought to be holistic. Psychology is important, but it, it's not the only lens, and it should be unified with other fields, both inside and outside the natural sciences. Let's close uh, today with one potentially unexpected field that should be integrated into all of this, and that is erotology, or the study of the virtues. Now this may seem like, oh, we're jumping you know, all over the place, but, but we can see an organic link here between these two fields, that is psychology and erotology. And that link is evident in the Renaissance that we're seeing of Stoic philosophy. Tired of being pulled around by disordered desires or inclinations, many have recently sought out the path of self-mastery and have rediscovered the classic cardinal virtues of prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. And this resonates. You may have all your tasks neatly organized. You may be crystal clear on the goals, projects, etc., whatever. All that can be in place, and you can still feel lazy. You can still let an undisciplined curiosity distract you. You can still let envy taint your work. You can still let fear hold you back from doing what you know is right. These elements may be harder to pin down, but they're real and they need to be acknowledged and factored in. Virtues are an integral part of the art of workflow and their formal inclusion within this field is overdue. Internally or externally, you cannot sustainably act well if you do not live well.